Okay, I'll like switch to the other side. And go. Hello. Good evening. Welcome to the first ever Running Free Live. I'm Denise Erickson, co-founder of Media Mentors, and I'm delighted that you could all join us tonight. Thanks to Film Victoria for supporting this and to Acme for doing the amazing job of broadcasting and producing. We've got amazing guests tonight as we talk about pivoting production, something that's so topical at the moment. I'll say a quick hi to them first, but then I'll tell you a little bit about what we're going to do. Hello, Chris Oliver Taylor from Fremantle. Hey, Denise. Good to be here. Dan Brown from Joined Up Films in Perth. Hello. And Kathy Scott, Dancing with the Stars EP. Hi there. And Sarah Thornton from Channel 10. Hi. Thank you. Oh, lovely to see you all. It's so exciting. Um, this session really is important to us all, not just because we're going to talk about pivoting production, but we're also going to have a crack at actually networking. So what we want to do at the end of it is we're going to throw each of you to some Zoom rooms, which we'll talk about that in a minute. But the session tonight is going to talk generally about the production landscape in these weird and wonderful times. Then we're going to talk specific productions because these guys are the ones that have been pivoting production. We're going to do Dancing with the Stars, Neighbours, The Project and Coronavirus, Our Story. And then we're going to talk a bit about commissioning and what's being developed and where to now. But right now, I think I should shut up and start talking with my guests. But I do hope you've got your glass of something. Mine's empty because I have to wait till later. Um, enjoy. So let's talk generally about the production landscape. Now, Sarah, I am going to talk with you first because what triggered this session for me was the feeling that actually Channel 10 is the network that can do at the moment and is doing. And so I thought that it'd be great to sort of say, why, how come you guys seem to be leading the pack? That's where it looks like for me. Oh, I'm not, um, I'm not sure we could state that claim, but I do think, um, you know, uh, Bev McGarvey had taken over as um, sort of the, the leader of our business days, moments before um, things started to kind of close in with COVID-19. And, um, you know, sort of upon reflection, as I've been thinking about the last month or so, because um, it's been a bit of a whirlwind, really, and I feel like we're only just emerging a little bit to take stock. I have to say, um, you know, for us, I think the drive came from the top and um, there definitely is no person I would rather be led through a, a storm that we've been, it, such a storm that we've been through. And I think the three things that have really stood out for me is really her trust in her management team to get things done, which has meant that we've then been able to trust as well, because th there's no way you can get through a time like this without trust. Um, true leadership, which I think Bev has shown, and um, and communication, and and it it really has for us. I think all flow, you know, come from the top. She's incredibly robust, uh, steadfast, and you know, driven. And, and I think that we've all kind of you know fallen in line, really. Um, and just started doing. Yeah, and look, I I also think as a kind of newbie at ten there is a can-do culture, sometimes to our detriment, um, because I think sometimes there are people who take on too much. But, you know, it was a thing that really, sometimes I forget, but, you know, when I first started, it really struck me how whoever you encounter in the business, if you ask them to do something fairly unreasonable, they will try. And I think that that culture, you know, it's a, it's a business that has been through a lot. And I think that this is just an, another thing for the business to get through. Really, and, and so it has. It has bred a kind of a, a mindset that actually has left set us in good stead. And we'll talk about some of your productions in more depth um, later. Chris, what's your take on the landscape with COVID nineteen happening on the production landscape? What do you What are your thoughts? Well, look, it's been it's been devastating for producers, uh, and I'm sure networks as well for slightly different reasons. Um, you know, as, as Sarah rightly says there, it, it feels like there's some light coming. It absolutely does. And I think Australia, you know, 
from a health perspective has, has been very fortunate and managed it very well, or at least I think we will, we will feel it has. But from a television point of view, every show bar a few, nearly all of them were closed down. And, and what that meant, and where I think it's real devastation that's not been dealt with yet is, is even though government did try to apply JobKeeper to many industries, it missed the majority of the arts sector. And that's where the devastation actually is almost not being noticed. Um, it's definitely noticed by us uh, as, as people have stood down. What that meant in a very, very simple way was the minute we could not produce our shows and all producers I know, I'm sure that my fellow panelists here would agree, every show tried to continue on until the point they couldn't. They either weren't allowed to or it just was not safe to do so or not possible. And that meant for the most part that those shows were shut down and everyone involved in them, the production team, cast, crew, was stood down with next to no pay immediately and then didn't qualify for JobKeeper for, for a significant period of time. And, yeah. Yeah. and that's a massive issue for us. So I think the production sector has been hit really hard um, and we've now got to work quickly, efficiently, cleverly uh, and safely to get our shows back together in partnerships with our broadcasters. And one of the things that we'll talk about where you are doing that is with Neighbours. Are there other shows that you're being able to sort of look at rebooting at the moment? We, we kept Grand Designs uh, for Foxtel running and Restoration for the ABC running, you know, smaller shows. And obviously, by the type of those shows, we, could, we felt we could do that. And we were in post with a couple of others, which, which I think quite a few shows were. We lost uh, Australia's Got Talent for Channel 7. That just couldn't be made at the time. Uh, we were nine days out from the studio uh, and we lost two other dramas, Wentworth for Foxtel um, and then a drum for Channel 10, actually, which um, the guys will know, and Channel 5 together combined by a CBS commission called uh, With Intent. And that was lost because of cast, because our leads, one was a, a British actress who had to go home, one was an Australian who lived in LA. And as the borders were closing, we lost our two leads. So mm -hmm. we lost, lost four shows and managed to keep four going, I think. Wow, yes, you have set up the scale of it. Um, I think, you know what I think I'm going to do? I'm actually just going to start talking about some of the specific productions that are happening because I just think it's so terrific that there are shows that have been able to, you know, adapt and get on air. So let's start with that. And, Kathy, I'm going to start... Um, oh, talking to you first because yeah. Dancing with the Stars is a fascinating example. You were caught bang slap really in the middle of your of your run, weren't yeah, you? Yeah, we were. We were. I mean, you know, had 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 the the, the health crisis started a month earlier, we would we wouldn't have got to air. You know, we were going day to day really, not week to week. Uh, and we were just lucky to get the series finished even I'm though gonna... it was shortened talk to you about how you did that. But look, I've got a clip here and I'll take un unashamed embarrassment for editing this how I did. So it's nothing to do with Network 10 and it's nothing to do with Dancing with the Stars. But let's just have a look at how you were before COVID and what happened afterwards. Could you play that clip, please? Aussie legend Olivia Newton-John will watch her daughter Chloe debut on Dancing with the Stars. I want my mom and dad to be proud of me wow. and show people what I'm made of. Chloe brought the love to the dance floor. How proud you must be. How did you feel watching her, Olivia? Oh my goodness, I'm so proud. It was an extraordinary night on Dancing with the Stars. For the first time ever without a live studio audience. That clip just sort of really showed me what you went to yeah. and from. Yeah, well, I mean, you know, we Warner Brothers did an amazing job and, um, you know, Karen Green, the, the Warner's executive producer, she is very familiar with this format, has done many series of it. And, you know, when, when it happened, we had no choice. We have to be nimble, you know. You have, to, you have to look at what is possible and how you can potentially finish the series. And... You know, at first we thought, oh, without the studio audience, it'll just it'll just die. It'll be dead. There'll be no vibe. The, the celebrities and the dancers will will struggle to lift because the audience really brings them up. Um, but I think, you know, we're all going through it together. You know, it, all the we you know we have 150 crew on a weekend. You know, everybody was there. We we wanted to keep the show running. We wanted to get to its you know logical conclusion. Um, and How did you do that? 
Well, we 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 did we did a lot of things. Every every week something else changed. So you know, our first week I think we were we were due to have first of all we were due to be nine episodes, and we ended up being eight. Um, episode six was our first non uh, audience episode. Um, and that was, you know, that was on the advice, you know, I, I was network EP for 10 and, you know, 10 has a, a government and regulatory affairs person who is in constant conversation with government and premier's department. So we were, we were sort of ahead of the announcement. So we had to ensure that, that everything we did complied with, you know, current health and safety. So, you know, at the time of our first non-audience episode, we had some crew in the audience, but but socially distanced, and um, you Did know that, that, work? That, that sort of worked for us. And then we realised, yeah, we, you know, we could still continue on with it. It was it was a bit different, you know. We didn't try and hide the cracks, so um, you yeah, know, the, the the dancers sort of stepped up, and and because the dancers and the celebrities that you know they're always together every day, so they didn't have to socially distance because they they were like family by then. So, um, but we have, um, we had a lot of, um, you know, OH&S and, and um, we, we have had a lot of... Um, so you sort of mark up the studio? Oh, and yeah, all, all that sort all of All of that. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, you know, all, you know, we had, had complied with all the, the social distancing in, in rooms. We had people going around every hour, you know, wiping down hard surfaces. We had medics doing uh, random temperature checks on any of our crew that were there. Any non-essential crew obviously didn't work from the studio. So, um, And you did also have a close brush with COVID-19. We did. We did. We did. With Christian Rilke. Yeah. At, the end of, uh, at the end of our episode six, we had a call to say that Richard Wilkins had tested positive to COVID and Christian the previous week had literally slept in the same house as Richard. But, um, you know, what did you do? Well, basically, uh, well, Christian went straight into lockdown and was tested immediately. Um, and, you know, thankfully, 48 hours later, he was he was tested negative. But he he and his partner had to remain in lockdown for the full 14 days. So wow. we we're fortunate enough that um, he could he could remain in his hotel, which was near the studio. And it had a, a, a rooftop space that obviously for the subsequent episode, even though he was clear, we still couldn't bring him back into the fold. So he, he, uh, he and Lily performed up there and we had two, um, we'd set up two remote locked off cameras. And so there were no crew up there. You know, we, we, we modified things with, you know, no miking and, um, you know, they dressed themselves, did their own makeup, all those sorts of things. So, and much uh, relief when it was found clear. Absolutely, absolutely, and I mean, it was it was it was that funny time at the beginning of the crisis, and I don't think anybody really, you know, we were all trying to get to grips with what it all means, you know, what does social distancing mean? Can I get it if I walk past somebody? You know, all that sort of stuff. So we had a lot of a lot of concerned crew. And, oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, and you you were saying to me that if they didn't want to work on it, they didn't have to. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Now I was going. I, I am going to play a really quick clip because partly because I love this clip and it shows because Craig was in the UK. Correct? Well, see, as I said, week week on week, as as um, you know, we got more advice on what we should be doing. We we had to adapt. So I think you probably noticed by the last episode, we were handing in a hand mic on a uh, on, a, <laughs> on a, a long fish pole. You know. It's a bit of me, which would like to have stayed home and not had him. But how did you how did you yeah. manage to show well, him the show? Well, what happened as the borders were shutting and you know countries were shutting, kind of shutting down. I mean, we had, Craig had to get home. So after our uh, our semi final, um, he literally got on a plane. We got him home sort of halfway through the week, and we used uh, we ended up using live view technology and uh, sort of IP based. Um, you know, comm systems to actually set up the live link. But we, again, we had, we set up a camera in his home in Hampshire. And what um, a gorgeous home it is, by yeah. the look of it. <laughs> Very special. And, you know, it could have all gone horribly wrong. But, you know, there were some amazing, amazing um, technical brains that sort of put all that together. And, you know, the team from Gravity did a phenomenal job. And, you know, I think we ended up with less than a second delay 
on that those pitches. They were very stable pitches, so we were really lucky, and everything was obviously judged in real time. Brilliant. All right. Look, it's time for neighbours, I think. <laughs> oh, <laughs> oh, here she comes. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, we've got an escapee in the asylum. <laughs> well, we've had all sorts of issues on shows that we've been doing, Sarah. That was a welcome addition. I love it. Um, now, where was it? No, no, neighbours. That's what I'm talking about. Um, Chris. We're going to come to you and tell me about some of the moves that you took. Now, we're going to play the clip while you talk because we've got some stills from the set. What sort of things did you have to put in place? Well, I mean, there's a, a whole bunch of, this is this is post when we returned a week or two ago, but we actually had a bit of a, I say a head start. We were working as Kathy was outlining with, with dancing, but as the government was closing down the country, we were also trying to stay ahead. And so we did a lot of work before Easter. And these shots you see here are taken after Easter. I've not been on set at all. So because I'm not allowed to, because I'm not an essential um, part of Neighbours. So I'm not allowed to go on set. No one is, unless they're absolutely essential. And you can see there just the distancing they're putting in place. Mm -hmm. Similar things on those kind of pictures, monitors are split up in twos now so continuity and directors now are one and a half meters away at least they're normally as you'd imagine very close together um the way we're rehearsing and running lines there which bonnie and uh, i'm sure that guy there is bonnie's running um you know they're distancing apart that is a new bit of technology we put in place that is digital extras they're not there in real life they're now that's a projected plate which we've never done before wow. um it's not quite been put in place they were trying it yesterday i think so we've tried that innovation to remove extras but so what we've done really is we, we had a couple of issues. We, we had a scare as well quite early on, just before, you know, maybe three before Easter. One of our makeup artists had worked with someone who um, had been diagnosed at the Melbourne Fashion Festival. And so what we did, and it's interesting as a leadership challenge, this, I'm sure everyone would have the same view that there's no, there's no playbook for this. You know, no one's got any rules as to what you do with a global pandemic mm. or how you close a show down. You, you, there's no, I mean, there's, there's no one's fault. There's no network yelling at me or there's no, no one's not trying to do the job. It, it's just a, a situation we have to try and deal with together. So when this, uh, the makeup artist came to see me straight away um, and said that she's been exposed, what, what do we do? So what I thought we would do, we called the entire cast and crew together. And this was just as it was breaking here. So we weren't in lockdown, we weren't in, um, we weren't closed down, uh, but we called everyone together, uh, 130 people, all cast, all crew. And we just held a Q and A together and just said, guys, I've got no answers. What do we want to do? Here's the facts as I know them. Uh, it's a secondary potential infection. What do you want to do? And I then broke the teams up into cast, studio, location, makeup, wardrobe, into their kind of their groups and said, go and have a chat. What, what should we do together? And they came back and we decided as a bunch of just adults, not necessarily TV producers, that we'll take a break. And we took a break for a day and a half just to reset. And we put some in place some things. Because one thing we found out was that this uh, uh, makeup artist uh, who was so diligent and so worried and had no reason to be, had actually made up most of our cast in the, in the two or three days and had been all over the site. And if you've ever been to Nana Wadding, I know oh, most of you wow. have. It's enormous. And so that was a, that could have been a disaster. Now she was diagnosed um, not, she didn't have COVID, so that was fine. We got back to work on the Friday, we were told on the Wednesday, and we, um, and we carried on. But what it allowed me to do, leading that team with Jason Herbison, who's our exec producer, and Nat Lynch, our series producer, they allowed the three of us to say to cast and crew, we don't have all the answers, we're in this together, what shall we do together? And so there was no edict from anyone that they had to work or didn't want to work. And what came through was, People wanted to work. They wanted to be safe. Um, it's led by in drama by cast. If the cast can't work, it, it doesn't matter what the crew say. We can't make the show. But if the crew Did any of them work, mind working? Were, were they all keen to work? Every single one. And we had a, we had a secondary meeting maybe a, a week or two later as the situation was getting worse. And that's when, you know, amazing part, you know, Ryan Maloney, um, um, who's playing um, uh, Toadie, Jared, uh, was fantastic and uh, Colette Mann um, was, was amazing just standing up and just saying there's no there's no debate just standing up in front of 130 people I think we should make the show I think we should we should make this show safe and then we should make the show and then all the crew had their conversation and everyone agreed 
So what we did uh, is we, we'd already started the planning how we we're going to shoot. Uh, the exec, the series producer, and myself walked onto every location, every studio. We talked to the, all the people, all the crew, all the cast every day uh, and just kept checking it and evolving things. So evolving makeup, evolving hair. Uh, the writers were astonishing because this is the one advantage Neighbours has, unlike Paul Cathy, who's got a very narrative linear way to go we've got to get to the end of a series and give a winner neighbors could rewrite and to, to sarah's point earlier about bev we had bev paul uh paul and and uh, and and rick the marvelous rick uh, may on our show helping us through this and not giving us any issues on editorial just allowing us to change as we needed to to get the show to easter we broke four days early we just felt it was getting we didn't know what the next announcement from government was going to be we just we were watching every night and texting each other after Dan Andrews said something and of course Victoria's in quite a hard lockdown or Morrison said something and then could we shoot could we not shoot yes we could writers would write that night or that morning we then shoot the next day we broke at Easter we extended our break by uh, a, two weeks in total but we paid the crew a couple of days extra and put some leave forward and then we broke stood the crew down for a week so the crew lost a week's pay that we hope will make up during the year with our other production breaks. And then we came back, um, when was that? Two and a half weeks ago now, two weeks ago now. And um, we've changed everything. The site is split into four. There's red team, yellow team, blue team, pink team. They're not allowed to cross areas. Mm. Friday's the only day that actors can cross teams. And we're very, very careful on who and how. There's no kids, there's no extras. There's catering in four sites. You can't leave the sites. There's temperature checks as you go into the gates. If you're above 37.5, you have to go into a high temperature bay and wait there for five minutes. Your temperature gets taken again. Wow. Um, the nurse then makes an assessment as to whether you're just sent, if you're, if you're still high, you're sent home instantly. But whether you're referred for medical advice, she makes that, you know, it gives you the advice. You can't diagnose you, of course. Um, and, then, and then away you go. Everything's changed. Everyone's working at home where possible. Riders are, designers are. Um, you have the option to do your own makeup, do your own hair. Um, set dressings changed, set checks have changed, rehearsals have changed. Wow, it's amazing. I mean, I think what it shows to me with what you're describing is how resilient and determined that your teams are, but obviously led well, because that smacks a brilliant organisation by the team. And But, it, you know, it's, it's just amazing to listen to that change so quickly. Well, look, I can't praise that team enough. Um, a bit like Sarah was saying about Bev, you know, he's a part of our neighbours team. The leadership that Jason and Nat and then our line producers um, and, our, and, our, and our heads of department and people like Adam Knoll, who's our first AD, who leads our team, and Kate Kendall, who's been a director and actor and is now producing. All these very senior, experienced people, some have been there for 35 years and been there since day one. They're the voices that matter. They're the mm. ones who know the show incident and know how to make this machine tick. Um, and they're the ones who led either from the front or from within or from the top. So that leadership came from every single part of the business um, and every single person had their, had their place to play. There was no- it's amazing. I, I wasn't the boss per se. I just had the mouthpiece. It was the juniors, the seniors, and it was every single person. Oh, I love people. it. We gave everyone the option not to work every single person came back to work yeah. every single day it's amazing just like yours Kathy yeah yeah yeah. I mean it goes it, everybody just has to be nimble you know they have to find solutions yeah and talking about finding solutions we're coming to the project now with you Sarah and we're happy for the little extra to pop in whenever she <laughs> takes a fancy um for the pillow fight uh, background <laughs> noise oh that's okay <laughs> We're, it's so amazing going into people's houses, just like when I was going at, at Craig's house. Oh, my God, look at that boudoir. This is so exciting. <laughs> now, the boudoir, sorry. <laughs> oh, well, I don't know. We'll, we'll put, I, no one is going to trump Craig tonight. There's no, no question. I just didn't realise he was actually Santa Claus. <laughs> no, that's right. I was about, yeah. I'm very alarmed for Christmas. God help us with Christmas if that's what his house looked like during the year. <laughs> now, the project. Mm -hmm. um, again, it's been a, you know, a significant change because the show had a, an audience. It had, um, you know, the intimacy of the panel on the, on the actual sort of desks. Tell us about 
when you started to realize that you had to change and, and what did you do? Yeah. Um, well, I guess one of the advantages of being on a news show is you are following uh, the course of events fairly closely. Um, and uh, I'm not going to claim to all, always have been ahead of the curve, but there were a couple of decisions that we made very early on, which I think helped us. Um, and it's and I guess the other thing to say is um, I was in an interesting position with a couple of productions in that I look after shows that are um, semi in-house or use 10 facilities uh, with production companies. So there's been some incredible collaboration um, in this instance with Roving and Craig Campbell and um, Chris Bendall, the co-EP. Um, so, you know, I, it's required a lot of different people on a lot of different levels. So, you know, we've had to work with um, the, the 10 um, side of things in the facilities management, which is set under me. And then we've had to work to protect the roving staff who sit under roving and then the talent who are dispersed amongst roving and 10. So we all had responsibility for different people and had to find a cohesive plan, which, you know, again, I think comes, uh, speaks to, the kind of magic triangle of leadership, trust, and communication. Yeah. <laughs> I feel yeah. like I've turned into a management coach. No, no, um, but it's true. It's just listening to what Chris was saying. It's exactly yeah. that. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, um, some particular people have really uh, stepped up to the plate, uh, you know, and so we've leaned on them to, to, to get to where we are now with the show. But um, we sent people to work for what we tried to do was make decisions before we had to. Um, and I think that was be because we wanted to ensure that it would work. So we sent people to work from home, more people than needed to, to work from home at a very early stage. We also split teams so th that they were working on different floors very early before, um, well, we've never had to do that, but before anyone else was kind of doing that. And we shut down travel for our talent, again, before travel was shut down um, and removed uh, audience and um, the, what the, the role that we call the fourth or the kind of guest panellist from the desk quite early. I think at every point it felt like we were kind of killing one of our babies with the editorial choices. Mm -hmm. um, but I think the thing that's been incredible is there are choices that we made that in hindsight we feel have improved the show. Um, well, actually, I think we might come to that in a minute because some of the stuff you were talking about was great about, you know, looking at some of the changes mm. um i'm just going to play a little clip first and again i take glorious responsibility for the editing of this one um but it does again show the before and the after for the project can we have clip four please <laughs> no. <laughs> it's so great to have you here tonight. Great also because I didn't realise you guys were such good friends. Yeah. Yeah. Bring Courtney a birthday present. It's her birthday today. Oops. Happy birthday. <laughs> <laughs> Look, we even coordinated out I know, it's amazing. <laughs> How long have you guys been and... friends with you for? I met at Mardi Gras yeah. here in Sydney yeah. um, almost 10 years ago. Yeah. And Adam joins us now. Adam, that is such a banger, that song, and you've called it You Are the Champions. Was remaking such a classic an easy decision for you? It was really an interesting challenge, you know, doing this in quarantine. Uh, everybody recorded their parts separately on a phone. And the reason I played that is we've gone from glorious studio to you know, Adam's house and, and all of that entails with dodgy internet connections and things. Um, have you noticed that the audience has really cared about any of that? Well, I, I mean, the ratings would suggest that they, they don't. Um, I, I think uh, there are some things that matter and some things that don't, really. Um, and, and there are things that we've had to change uh, in the rundown and the way we produce the show to, to make it work without an audience, for example. You know, um, actually the project nearly launched without an audience over 10 years ago. And um, on the eve of the launch show, uh, Husey just said, I, I, can't, I can't do it, you know. And we've always felt, and the, the comedy, whoever's in the comedy chair has always felt very strongly that they couldn't perform without an audience. And the first night we removed the audience, it was awkward, to be honest. But 
we could immediately see that there were things we could do as the production team to fix that. And so we have, and, and in many ways, removing the audience, I think has drastically improved the show. It has meant that we speak directly to the viewer and it has, it has meant that we've had to have um, a tighter rigor when it comes to the rundown because we can't rely on applause or laughter to keep the momentum of the show going. The hosts work harder. We're more reliant on their chemistry, which I think has completely shone in this time. I mean, when you see Carrie, Pete and Waleed on the desk together, that I think the chemistry between the three of them is wonderful at the moment. And, um, and we've had to look really at um, no sort of lazy moments in the show um, where we would, would ordinarily have just pulled out on a lovely audience shot, had a bit of applause and kind of gone to break or change segment. Our gear changes are far more reliant on um, hosting, scripting and, you know, um, other production techniques. So that's probably number one. Um, and then number two, I think our kind of second big learning uh, is guests. Um, we had a, I still remember the last guests we had on the desk um they um it just felt wrong all of a sudden and it wasn't technically wrong at that moment in time but I remember we all watched the show and got in touch afterwards and just said this has to stop we can't wow. we can't do it anymore it, it feels uncomfortable to watch and it was amazing because the, the world was changing so quickly yeah. um so we just made the decision and we had no idea what it would be like to either do all of our guest spots via Skype, or um, if someone does come into the studio, we actually place them in a small um, uh, green screen room. So they never have contact with the hosts and they don't they don't go to the hair and makeup and, you know, so okay. there's complete separation. And, and really throughout this, a lot of our decisions have been made around keeping the show on air. We feel that we, we made a big commitment to ourselves to stay on air. And I think um, to quote Bev, if the project's off air, Channel 10 is off air. Wow. Um, so we, we were pretty determined to continue. Again, we gave all staff the option to cease working. And some people um, did, who we probably wouldn't have sent home have chosen to work from home and that's fine. Um, but we, we've been very careful um, to keep the hosts safe. Uh, we've separated our team. So our Sydney team and our Melbourne team have no cross pollination. Um, okay. I, I think too, it's sort of one of the things I'd like to do is play that's the second clip I've got because it actually illustrates some of the things that you're talking about and how you have managed to actually get that sparky spontaneity, even though this is from a trailer, which we'll play now if we can. It looks great. Step out of line and I'll squirt you with my big bottle of disinfectant. <laughs> Tried in the frozen food section. I'm amazing. They will be showing that footage later <laughs> on in the show. Isolation is about to get real interesting. <laughs> I don't know what to do with that, so let's just keep moving. <laughs> Time for today's top stories. Are you happy with that, Rachel? <laughs> the project on 10. So the people that we saw there in the separate room, are they actually in the sort of green screen room or how does that work? Uh, yes, and actually in in, those, in that instance, sometimes they are. So Emery Shiano is in our small studio in Melbourne. Um, at the same time as the hosts being on the desk in the main studio in Melbourne. Um, the rest, are, are what we're now doing is firing up the Sydney and the Melbourne studio at the same time. And so we, um, so Rachel Corbett, who had the squirty bottle uh, yeah. in Sydney, and then Tommy Little uh, is in Melbourne when we're using the Sydney um, hosting lineup. So okay. we've just, um, we've done some Tetris with our lineup to ensure that um, the hosts are never cross pollinated essentially. Right. And, and, you know, Craig Campbell has been extraordinary in this because he's um, he's been tireless at working on eyeline. And I think uh, if you watch a show, you'll see that um, sometimes you can't even tell that someone's not in the same room because we've got monitors set up so that there's an off camera eyeline and a two camera eyeline. And, mm. you know, we, we've, we've worked really hard to retain chemistry even when people aren't in the same room. And wow. part of that is testament to the talent. Yeah. And part of that is testament to the production team and, and, and the efforts that they've gone to. The number of text messages I've had on iLine 
um, over the last few weeks it has been extraordinary, or the last month or so has been What, from the public or from your team? So from the team. <laughs> Public have become very educated all of a sudden. Yeah. So I'll start getting texts from the public. I'll be my mum next. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Well, we are actually talking about this. We are taking questions and I'll start feeding them in in a minute. So feel free to ask your questions and uh, we'll start feeding them in. But it's important now because I want, this is a story that actually, um, oh, Chris Oliver Taylor's got a big fat glass of red. Would you like to just show the uh, show the people at home, please? It just, got delivered, it just got delivered to me, so I'm not sure I'm going to drink it. I would be so rude not to. I'm overexcited. <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> the mind's still empty. <laughs> Sorry, back to you, Dan Brown. This is a story that actually really triggered this discussion for me because Dan I've known for a very long time and he texted me and said, have a look at the stock on Channel 10 that we're doing. We got it commissioned on a Friday night at 10 o'clock. Holy hell, who's ever done that? I've never heard of that before. <laughs> and 16 days later, we were on air and it was one of your shows, Sarah. Yeah. But I'm going to go to Dan because how did it come about? Well, the first thing I'd say is I thought that what we'd done was pretty remarkable, but listening to everybody else has just given me such a headache. All the, all the <laughs> difficulties that everyone else has been going through, ours was simple and over in 16 days. But how it came about, I, it's all a bit of a blur, but I think we, we were talking about something else, some other development, and the conversation came around, if you were going to do a documentary on COVID-19, what would it look like? And I had a all, sort of like an instinctive feel of what it should look look and feel like and what it should do and it was pretty much what I needed then which was some help to get through this so how could Australia get through this together using you know mateship and and how what was going on before so you tell us a little bit more oh no carry on sorry I interrupted too prematurely so I sort of had a bit of a think about it and then it just sort of came out in a sort of flow and I sent it to Sarah and Kieran and it sort of resonated with them. And that was, I, I think I probably sent it about six o'clock Perth time on a Friday night. So eight o'clock Sydney time. And then it went through, and this goes back to what Sarah was saying about like can do. I'm not just saying it because Sarah and Ten are here. They just worked. It, it was just ridiculous what they did, turning around notes at 11 o'clock at night, getting stuff commissioned at 10 o'clock. It was just a different level of production. And that was partly due to the speed that we had to get this stuff done. But it was also just, how quickly they responded and how much they knew what they wanted. If and God, may there, that continue. But I'm going to play a little clip first because people might not, they might not have seen coronavirus, our story. Can we have that clip, please? Rapping by myself in isolation. I get a break from you, chumps, and that's elation. Lockdown has changed our lives overnight. We don't have masks. I now use my headband, which once upon a time would have made me look like a gangster. Coronavirus Australia, our story, 7.30 Tuesday. Oh, Sarah had a big smile on her face watching that, but I'm not going to let her talk because I haven't finished hearing from Dan yet. Um, how the hell did you pull that together? I noticed there was a lot of archives and things, but tell me a bit about the process. Yeah, I mean, so as soon as on the Saturday after we got the, the sort of green light, we sort of split the team into sort of creative and logistics because we were all, we were very lucky that we were set up to work from home. So we had to work out how to make this film, how to edit it, how to deliver it, how to create it. So we set the teams up in, in two separate areas. We had three assistant editors, two main editors, and then people doing interviews and pulling stuff down. But because everyone was in lockdown, we had to have a runner running, you know, literally driving drives from place to place for about 12 hours each day for, for 16 days, just moving this material around. We had a sort of base of what we were going to do. We knew that we wanted to have celebrities telling us bits and pieces of how they, how they were coping, how they were getting through it. We knew we wanted some experts in there. So it was really actually completely different to anything that we've done before. So, and things that we've learned from that, interviews on Skype or on Zoom, you know, were just so useful. We could literally be talking to Craig Foster at four o'clock and be interviewing him at five o'clock and have it in the edit suite by six o'clock. I mean, yeah. it, was just, it was just crazy. All the rules went out the window and we just had this opportunity to be flexible and, do, and try new things. 
and that was really really exciting and i think it, i mean I thought, editor, sorry i was just going to say that the other thing that really helped us do it is we put a post director on in the uk so we were able to run suites or have been productive for 24 hours a day so rather than 16 days we could turn that into sort of essentially 32 uh, which is what we would have needed Wow, it's an amazing story. Has it changed your business in in, in, in a way, um, Dan? I mean, have you got lessons out of this you're going to take into the future? Oh, look, definitely. And I think they're probably uh, being flexible, being nimble are really important. If, you, if we'd have, I mean, we're obviously a very different beast to, to uh, Fremantle. We have much smaller overheads, but we have far fewer shows. So the ability to be nimble has been really important. And just it's changed what I think is possible. If someone had said to me, you know, can you deliver a, a new documentary for a broadcast that you haven't worked with before in 16 days, in normal situations, you would have said, no, I just can't right. do that. But there was something about the sort of blitz spirit, I suppose, that you just went, yeah, let's do it. Why not? What, let's, we will make sure this happens. And we really did. I had times where editors were going, ah, oh, just I, we were not going to make it. And I was just determined that we were going to make it and make sure and everybody sort of pulled together people worked through the night that literally people editors worked sort of 24 hours in one go wow uh, to, to make sure that this happened it was uh it was so important and it because everybody wanted something to fight against you know we were all scared and worried and didn't know what the future was going to be like we were able to put maybe 16 staff on and give them work for you know 16 days um, which was really, yeah, I was as pleased about that as anything else, being able to help other people keep working. Sarah, that was a hell of a commission from you. You must have had your moments where you went, what the hell have we done? Sorry, I had myself on mute just in case. Oh. There's another invasion. Um, yes. Uh, so... Um, I smile now. It's partly a smile of relief, but it's also I feel really fond of this film. I think, um, you know, it, it was it captured an extraordinary moment in time. Um, the pitch that Dan made was so compelling. We were talking to uh, one other, seriously to one other production company who we thought was well placed to make a fast turnaround. And I have to just say, as a as someone who worked in production, you know, for a couple of decades, I'm always kind of loath to hand production companies this kind of commission. It's almost like you're handing someone a bit of a poison chalice and it can go one way or the other. And, um, you know, I've uh, spent many years at Discovery Channel as well, where I've got a lot of fast turnarounds under my belt. And I know, um, I guess I know some of the pitfalls. So I, I think hopefully I was able to help us avoid some of those. But it really was testament to Dan and his team what they delivered. Um, it, it, it surpassed, each viewing surpassed our expectations based on the last. They moved things on so much. And I remember once when I was an edit producer, someone saying to me, I really enjoy your cuts because when I come back, um, not only have you done my notes, you've done something else. And it always surprises me. And I remember thinking, is this like a backhanded compliment <laughs> like have I done something wrong but as a commissioner or a network exec I now know what that means and that's exactly what Dan and his team did you know they weren't just following our notes to the letter they every time they read our notes and interpreted them in a way um, that delivered more and I, I was smiling at the Fitzy bit because there were so many little unexpected moments in that documentary that I I didn't anticipate that they would get I mean Getting Fitzy to voice it, I think, was a, a bit of a masterstroke. Um, and, and, you know, they talk about us um, uh, responding and giving notes at midnight, which we did do, but um, they got notes and then edited the show at midnight. And um, I, I guess, you know, to your question of has it changed Dan's business, I guess the one change I hope it will make is that we will continue to do business because um, I think, uh, you know, it's experience, you know, it's, we've been through a little bit of a war together and and I really trust them explicitly now as a production company and, and hope that our working relationship continues. Great. So does this mean that you'll do some any other fast turnaround in this way? I oh, know your face, little face is dropping at that. <laughs> Not for some time, I hope. 
Um, generally, fast turnarounds are about a disaster. So I'm sort of, I feel like we've had two this year and maybe we could have a break from them for a while. Um, but definitely more doc series and to your, I was sort of trying to work through what I can say to your question, your, your point earlier about we, we'll talk about commissions. I mean, I don't think there's anything I can announce tonight, but we are, we are investing in doc series at 10. That's great. I'm glad to hear it. And so um, when we go into the Zoom room, I'm sure people will be asking a bit more detail on the sorts of things you might that might take your fancy um, later, because I think that'll be a really useful bit of information for them. Um, where to now? That's the question that I want to ask of each of you. And I do have a question here from the audience. One, somebody said, and this is a tough one for you to answer, actually, but I'm going to put it anyway because we should put tough questions. What are the pan – oh, God, my phone's letting me down again. So sorry. Uh, I'll come to that question in just a minute. Um, but what, what do you sort of – where to now? How do you pull out of this as an industry? And we'll start with you, Sarah, because I came to you first. Okay. Um, well, I guess um, one of the things I haven't mentioned so far that I, I feel I should say is um, I, I do feel that we have an extraordinary um, commitment that we must make to the freelancers who have kept this industry alive for a long time and we mustn't let them fall through the cracks. You know, I have good friends who are moving house this week uh, because they've lost, lost their jobs. Uh, they haven't been caught by the government in the way they should have been. And, and soon we will need them again. So um, I guess, uh, you know, I, I'm not suggesting that anyone who's listening uh, or watching isn't committed, but I, I guess I just want uh, people to know that, you know, we are committed as well and, and we see that we need to, to look out for you. Um, it's hard to, to predict where this will lead. Um, you know, we just did a series uh, with Waleed on what next. And, and the bottom line is we don't know. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I think uh, content will remain. We will need content. Content will be delivered to people. How that will be delivered and which businesses will be delivering it will be up to the people who run them to be uh, nimble, gnarly, um, bloody minded and, um, uh, you know, hardworking. And I think, uh, you know, there are plenty of people like that in Australia. Yeah. And I think, um, you know, in Australia, we're in a pretty lucky position to be able to continue. Um, I've got a lot of productions running at the moment. Um, I had just crewed up a, an entire series um, I think we hired our last person the week before we sent everyone home and we've managed to continue that through right. um, this period of time. And I think, um, you know, we have to keep everyone safe and we have to try to keep people working and we have to find a way to support each other through it. I, I don't know that I can answer it any more than that. Okay. but you know, That's fine. That's a good answer. Committed. I have... I have found that I have found the question. I'm just going to throw this open because whoever wants to pick up on this first, it would be great. What are the panel's thoughts on the government's decision to change local quotas? How do we ensure that local production, specifically drama, continues to be funded? Chris, you saw your hand up. Yay. Yeah, well, only because I think I'm, I'm heavily invested in this. And we, we as a sector working with government, I think it's highly complicated. And one of my answers to a question around what do we what do we do next actually what's happening is we're conflating two things at the same time which is either a master stroke or terribly dangerous and we have how do we respond to covid and how do we, um two things it suspended quotas uh for 2020 and potentially 21 which is very worrying and uh we also now have a options paper published to the sector to talk about the future of the industry, which is a worrying space. And I think that we should have our local networks should be fundamentally supporting Australian content and Australian stories, as we've seen tonight, with some fantastic types of Australian content, which should be unashamedly on Australian television. So there is a lot to answer that question directly. There is a lot of work going on by all the guilds, all the sectors, Free TV with a quite amazing Bridget Fair, who's working so diligently with the sector. Uh, with Graham Mason at Screen Australia, all the people who you'd expect to be involved are involved. And there's different positioning. I think as Sarah said there, there's different positioning. 
commercial networks have a massive challenge. You look at ITV's ad revenues overnight, down 42% for the month of April. A UK example, again, last year, the car industry sold 161,000 cars in the UK in April last year. This year, they sold 4,000. These are massive issues that we can't ignore. We can't ignore. But we can argue correctly and properly to ensure that Australian stories, particularly but not exclusively drama, are told. And that documentary that Dan put together is equally as important. And so is Dancing with the Stars, because that shows diversity and that shows reach and that shows fun and laughter. And all these things should be protected to some degree and our network should be encouraged to support Australian stories. Wow, I couldn't have put that better. Cathy, well, how are you feeling about the future? Well, I mean, I think, I think we, you know, it, it's a challenge. It certainly is a challenge. But I think we all, we have to start thinking outside of the square. I mean, that you know, things like big live studio shows, you know, they're, they're important in the landscape. You know, you need, you need those in, in your schedule. So how do you actually move forward and make them? How, how can you do them cost effectively? Um, you, you don't want to compromise what they are. I think they're just, you just need to start thinking perhaps a little bit differently to the status. Because you, you were saying too that because you're live, you, you were live on Dancing with the Stars, that was a huge advantage to you. Yeah, look, I, I mean, I, th I think there's not a lot of live to air um, entertainment um, on Australian television anymore. And I think, um, you know, and it goes back to those freelancers. There's some amazing freelancers that, that, that are so skilled in, in putting live shows to air. And, you know, there's not a lot of opportunities for them anymore. And I think it would be a real tragedy if those big shows sort of disappeared. But, um, you know, I think we just, we just have to, you know, look at, look at other ways of doing things, you know. I'm going to... That's the key. Sorry, I was just going to jump in there because I think that is the key, that, it's, that it, the industry has been disrupted so severely that that is an opportunity, you know, it's an opportunity to look at different ways of doing things and find yeah. innovative solutions. And the other thing I was going to say is we're really lucky in the factual space that a lot of stuff can be developed for further down the track. And we have great support from screen agencies like Screen West, who've gone really heavy into putting money into development to keep the industry moving. But they've got to make sure that their funds continue as well, because they're always under threat, Screen West. You know, the government money is always under threat. But that's what will have saved the majority of production companies in Perth, is that they had access to support from the government through this time. Um, Chris, this might be a quick one for you before we wrap it up and head to the Zoom rooms. Um, how are people, this is a question again from the audience, how are people addressing insurance and underwriters for productions? Huge issue. Um, been lots of work done again by the sector in concert with the networks. And I should call out Nick Murray and Emil Sherman at Seesaw, Nick at CJZ, who've done a fabulous work uh, on a paper that's gone into government and been presented to the minister. Now, I don't know what the minister's view is, of course, but the, the understanding there is that until the vaccination is found, that the government would be the, la the insurer of last resort. So you put every insurance in place, but we cannot get insurance for a pandemic, clearly. And who bears the risk if a show is shut down for two weeks, three weeks, whatever it might be. And we've got to presume that's going to happen. As Sarah said earlier, and I concur, we will get shows back. And I suspect we'll also lose one or two on the way on the journey back. So the, 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 the model put forward is very simple. The government becomes the insurer of last resort until, it is, until there's a, um, a vaccine found, in which case we should revert back to where we are now. So that paper's gone to the minister, I understand. And Nick's presented that to SPA, uh, the producer lobby, uh, and work with uh, many people, many senior producers to, to, to shape that. But all credit to Nick and, and Emil for taking that, that, that challenge on. Oh, look, it's just about time to wrap up. I'm going to ask you one question without notice to each of you, and I'm going to start with Sarah. What are you watching at the moment? Ideally Australian, apart from all your shows, but you can plug one of them. I'm watching a lot of the project, I've got to say. Um, uh, I'm watching... Um, Looks like a guilty secret. What was that? A bit guilty. I've started watching, it's, it's not Australian, um, and it's on Stan, and it's called Broad <laughs> City, and uh, it's comedy. I just, I feel like in this moment I am turning to comedy. I'm also loving, and I have, I have to say this, but I mean it, um, Pete Hellier's new comedy, uh, new series of How to Stay Married. I am, I am a complete comedy fiend at the moment. I'm about to watch Taskmaster, um, the latest series, 
Um, and apart from that, I've started reading books again. I'm on my seventh attempt of, of Wolf Hall, and I'm determined that uh, a pandemic will finally get me to the end. Kathy, what about you? Um, well, my guilty pleasure was Zoe's Extraordinary Playlist, which was on Stan. And um, Mandy Moore was, was a producer and choreographer on that. And we had her guest on our first episode of um, Dancing with the Stars this season. So I was interested to see that. And again, it was very escapist. But, you know, I tend to watch a lot of, lot of ABC, certainly watch Project as well. So, and need to get back into reading. <laughs> okay. Well, Dan, what about you? Uh, Last Dance, the Michael Jordan documentary on Netflix, which is amazing. I'm loving Peaky Blinders. The production value on Peaky Blinders Series 5 is just unbelievable. Chris, yours. I'm watching, well, two, two things. I've got three young kids, so uh, two boys. So they're watching reruns of the 2005 Grand Final today. <laughs> AFL Grand Final, that was, that was a highlight. Um, and then what I'm actually watching... Another sporting thing, I'm watching The Test on Amazon, which is about the Australian. Oh. And as an Englishman, I'm now completely, because I was going for the Aussies, and I, I'm, it's completely turned my allegiance to, to or who I now support. It's a brilliant immersive documentary uh, and showcases the humanness of these elite sportsmen. I loved it. So it's well worth watching if you, even if you don't like cricket, it's just an amazing story. Well, the access on that is phenomenal, Chris. The access on The Test is something I've never seen before. It's mm. amazing. Yeah. amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I found that I've gone back to watching, you know, comfort food like years old Lewis's and Inspector Morse. That's so tragic. It's funny how it changed. But I am watching lots and lots of awesome Australian productions as well. And um, I'm going to wrap it up there because I've got to say thank you so much to a brilliant panel for letting us cut into your evening. Um, we will, by the way, to the panel, give you the Zoom addresses in just two texts. And please feel free to go to the Zoom rooms, but they're going to be moderated by me and by my co-founder, Esther Coleman-Hawkins. But what we want you to do is also ask questions of each other. So if you're looking for a producer for something you're working on feel free if you are saying oh my goodness how do I film this in times of COVID there's lots of people that are going to be in that room that'll be able to help you so thanks again to Film Vic for their amazing support and thanks to Acme who are oh my god they're like gold to us without them we'd be knackered. Now, there will be another one of these in one month from now. But in the meantime, there's also running free skill sessions, which are on the same YouTube channel that you're on now. Tomorrow is actually Tracy Mayer, who's the queen of publicity. Next week, we've got Rachel 